This video will provide an overview of socialism and a little bit about its history. We're going to go over orthodox Marxism and the Marxist and Engels conception of socialism. And then we'll talk a little bit about Lenin, Stalin, and Mao and how Leninism, Stalinism, and Maoism uh, deviated slightly from the orthodox tradition. And we'll talk about uh, those things towards the end of the video. A few sort of uh, a preface first. Uh, first, in order for this to not be a four-hour video, we're going to try to keep it as short as possible. We're going to have to simplify some incredibly, incredibly complex concepts. So, and by doing so, we'll do a disservice to a lot of those concepts. So just understand that uh, going in from the beginning. The second thing that's uh, helpful to understand is that Marx and Engels, in their original writings, used the term communism and the term socialism basically interchangeably. So know that in the beginning when we go through some quotes by Marx and Engels, um, that they use those terms interchangeably. And we'll talk about later on in the video uh, when that stops being the case, when those terms come to mean something different. Um, but just understand that going forward. Also understand that if you ever try to read Marx and Engels and you don't know that going in, sometimes it can lead to some confusion. Okay, so let's jump right in and talk about the Marxist and Engels. We have to include him anytime uh, we're having these conversations too and we'll read some quotes from him. The traditional Marxist or sometimes orthodox uh, Marxist conception of socialism and what that looks like. Before we dive into what socialism actually is, we have to understand some concepts that come from Marx and Engels that are crucial to the understanding of their conception of these ideas. And the first thing is this idea of materialism versus idealism. Now, this is one of those concept concepts that we're going to oversimplify for the sake of this video that's incredibly concept, uh, complex and highly debated. Um, so here we go. For Karl Marx, um, the historical constant, basically the one thing that has been constant since the beginning of time, is that humans must somehow produce their means of subsistence, meaning that humans have to make and generate and create from the earth what they need to survive, food, water, shelter, etc. Now, the way that they do this, Marx calls the mode of production, and that's a very crucial term when we're talking about Marxism, the mode of production. This is the system through which uh, human beings generate what they need to survive. Uh, and there are various different modes of production, which we'll talk about. Marx says that different historical eras are defined by different modes of production. And this is basically his timeline for how humanity has evolved at the material level. He says we started in what he would call a primitive communism. So these are like early, uh, quote unquote, tribal societies, pre-state societies, um, societies that would divvy up uh, the successful hunt or whatever they gathered, etc. in what Marx would say is a much more of an egalitarian uh, type system. So this is primitive communism. This is how, quote unquote, man uh, began. He said then the, things transitioned into what he calls ancient modes of production. And these include agriculture and slave societies. So as we go to through the Neolithic revolution, um, et cetera, and the material world changes, the modes of production that exist during those eras, he calls uh, the ancient modes of production. From then, we transition into feudalism. Um, with you, most people are aware of, think of like the estate system with uh, royalty, nobility, serfs, etc., knights, like those types of things. So that's the feudal mode of production. From the feudal mode of production, things progress into capitalism, which we are all familiar with uh, very clearly. This is a different mode of production, different than any mode of production that had come before feudalism, ancient modes of production, primitive communism, and so on. And then from there, Marx sort of predicts the future, and uh, though he says it's inevitable and scientific, that the uh, capitalist mode of production will eventually fall due to inherent contradictions within the system, which we'll talk about in this video, and then uh, socialism will follow, or communism. Remember, Marx and Engels use these terms interchangeably. We'll talk about when that changes and gets a little more specific uh, later on. So basically, the, it goes from primitive communism to ancient modes of production, feudalism, capitalism, and then finally, uh, communism. So another very, very crucial term is means of production. For Marx, means of production are the tools, technology, equipment, and so on 
that human beings use to produce what they need to survive, food, water, shelter, etc., like we mentioned before. So the mode of production is the system in which uh, people at any, in any given time create what they need to survive. The means of production are the actual tools, the actual things that they use uh, to generate. So that's another very important term, mode of production and means of production. And each mode of production has different means of production. Uh, so that's easy to think about if we think about the difference between a primitive communist uh, sort of ancient man, uh, the ways that they would create what they needed to survive versus the way that we do that in a modern, advanced, industrial, technological, uh, capitalist society. The means of production are very different underneath those different uh, modes of production. So just keep those two terms in mind. Uh, those are key. Next, we have to just very quickly, we can cover this because I think most people are familiar with this, the two terms for the two different classes in Marxist society. Again, we're simplifying this because there are actually other classes, uh, lump and proletariat, etc. But for the sake of this video, we'll say the two classes are proletariat and bourgeoisie. The proletariat are the working class and the bourgeoisie are the capitalist class. The way that you can tell the difference between the two in very simple terms is that the bourgeoisie have control over the means of production. So in Marxist time, it would be the bourgeoisie are those that uh, own the factories. Uh, in our time, it would be the bourgeoisie are those that own the companies uh, and so on. So that's a really key term, uh, two terms, I suppose, bourgeoisie and proletariat, the two classes in the Marxist conception of society. Very key to understand. Okay, now to this materialism versus idealism. For Marx, the material world, the mode of production, is the driving force behind the evolution of human history. This is known as materialism, or sometimes known as historical materialism. Under materialism, the ideas of the people of a society, the way that the people think, are a direct result of the mode of production, the material world. So people would think differently in a primitive communism and they would think differently under capitalism as an example. So I think that that's pretty easy to understand, but this is the opposite of idealism. And idealism is the idea that the mode of production or the material world is the result of the way that people think. It is the result of the ideas of the people. And history evolves as the result of pe uh, people thinking of new ideas. That's idealism. Under materialism, history evolves under the material world changing physically, and then as a result, people's ideas uh, changing. So that's kind of the difference between materialism and idealism. Uh, in simple terms, the difference between material and, uh, materialism and idealism is whether you believe that the material world is the driving force behind the evolution of history, or whether you believe that people's ideas are the driving force behind history. But the key for Marxism, for Marx's ideas and understanding them, is that Marx uh, believed in materialism. In fact, he develops the concepts that underlie the foundations of this theory. So he is a materialist. Um, that's key to understanding socialism from the Marxist standpoint. Another very fundamental concept that we need to understand is this idea of surplus. So for Marx and the primitive communism types of society, there was no surplus that was generated. That that began to be generated in the ancient modes of production, uh, slave societies, agricultural societies, and then continued and grew exponentially, being produced in uh, feudalism and capitalism. The main question is, who has a right to that surplus? What happens to the surplus? This leads us into the very root of the Marxist critique of capitalism. And for Marx, it has everything to do with labor. Marx uh, attempts to come up with how to determine the value of goods that are produced. And he basically comes to the conclusion that the one thing, the common thing that every good has is labor. That labor is required to generate everything, whether it's a shelter or whether it's a laptop or uh, whatever. Obviously, Marx was writing before laptops, but you get the idea. Um, labor is involved in every single one of those things. Even in a primitive communism society, there's labor involved in hunting, there's labor involved in uh, finding and building a shelter, there's labor involved in gathering, and so on. You get the idea. Labor is 
the root commonality between the uh, production of what is needed for humans to survive and then the surplus beyond that. And Marx emphasizes this concept of labor time, how much time is involved in producing something. So everything takes a certain number of man, of human hours to produce. So that's kind of the labor time and that we should be able to determine the value of something based on how much time goes into producing it. Now, there's a few terms that we need here. The first is necessary labor. Necessary labor is the amount of labor that one individual person needs to work in order to survive. So perhaps uh, if we use the modern capitalist example, perhaps you actually need to work six hours a day at your job in order to have basic food, water, shelter, um, and maybe some other minor things that you would need to physically survive uh, for you to uh, continue living. That would be necessary labor time. Uh, let's say it's six hours, or it might be uh, one hour, it might be uh, 20 hours, depending on your wages, in what society you live, uh, and so on. That would be necessary labor time. Surplus labor is the amount of labor that you work above and beyond that. So let's say that your necessary labor time is six hours. Uh, it doesn't work in our capitalist society to go to your boss and say, hey, I know I'm scheduled to work eight hours, but I work six and that's my necessary labor time. I'm good. And you clock out and leave. You're not going to have a job uh, for very much longer. That's not how it works. We work for a longer period of time. So let's say you have an eight hour shift, but your necessary labor time is six hours. There's two hours of surplus labor there. So you're working above and beyond what you need to actually survive. Another way of putting it is to think about an hourly wage. So let's say you work for $15 an hour, but every hour that you work, you actually generate $20 an hour for your company. Um, the surplus labor there would be the $5 an hour, the extra that you are generating. And your company owns that $5 an hour. You don't get to keep that uh, on your own. In fact, if you ever think that you do own that, you can go to your boss and ask for a $5 an hour raise and uh, see what happens. Uh, usually that's not going to go well for you. Though so far I've explained this in sort of the micro lens, using the micro lens in the sense of an individual laborer. Marx doesn't actually use these, uh, this lens when he's talking about these concepts. He uses a much more macro lens and talks about society overall, which is very, very important for us to understand when we're talking about the Marxist conception of uh, socialism. And he uses the term socially necessary labor time when talking about how much time goes into producing uh, any good or service. And he says, basically, socially necessary labor time is the time it takes for the average worker of average skill using standard tools and equipment to produce a given commodity. The reason this term is important is because it doesn't put the effort, uh, sorry, the focus on individual effort or ingenuity but on the co it emphasizes the complex relationships, both economic and social and others, uh, in society that lead to every single product being produced, which now we know in modern capitalist advanced industrial society what that looks like, how incredibly complicated it is for us to produce a laptop or a camera or our smartphones. Basically, anything in our society now requires an incredibly complicated network of individual laborers all across the globe and transportation and manufacturing and so on. So Marx always approaches this from the macro lens and uses socially necessary labor time. This also makes up for things like a shipment being destroyed as it crosses the ocean or something like that. That would be accounted for in socially necessary labor time, all of those types of things in research and development and so on. These, this is the time that society overall takes to produce these uh, goods and services, whatever they might be, what we need to survive, and then the surplus in our society. This leads us to Marx's main critique of capitalism, which is that the actual laborer has no right to his or her surplus labor. So you work, but you have no right to the additional that you create. Now it's interesting, it's important for us to understand that Marx doesn't ever make a moral argument here. He isn't saying that it's morally wrong that the worker does not have a right to that surplus labor. This is a common misconception that is used in the rhetoric of, I think, both the right and the left and all people when they talk about socialism. We go to the debate at the moral level, I think, really commonly, which is a kind of a perversion of Marx's concepts. He's not making a moral argument. In fact, he actually says, that it, it, the only way that it could be divvied up under capitalism is that the bourgeoisie has a right to the socially, uh, the surplus labor. And he says that's actually the problem. Uh, 
that that is the right thing to do under capitalism. He, and so he doesn't actually make a moral argument. His fundamental beef with capitalism is that it requires exploitation. It requires the bourgeoisie to exploit the proletariat and that, that without exploitation, capitalism would cease to exist. But like I said, this isn't a moral argument. This is an economic argument from Marx's standpoint. He's not making an ethical or a moral argument. He's saying that economically, capitalism cannot exist without exploitation. And that's the fundamental critique that Marx has of capitalism. Okay, so let's get into what is socialism then and how do we get from capitalism to socialism? Well, according to Frederick Engels, he says socialism, he says communism actually, remember they use these terms interchangeably. Communism is the doctrine of the conditions of the liberation of the proletariat. Okay, thanks Engels, but that doesn't actually help us to understand anything really, though I think people would definitely be impressed if they asked you what socialism was and you said that socialism is the uh, doctrine of the conditions of the liberation of the proletariat. That would probably impress a few people, but I think you better be ready with some more uh, definitions and an idea of what that concept is because questions are going to follow. So let's continue. Engels says, above all, it will have to take control of industry and of all branches of production out of the hands of mutually competing individuals and instead institute a system in which all these branches of production are operated by society as a whole. That is for the common account according to a common plan and with the participation of all members of society. Private property must therefore be abolished and in its place must come the common utilization of all instruments of production and the distribution of all products according to common agreement. In a word, what is called communal ownership of goods. He continues, in fact, the abolition of private property is doubtless the shortest and most significant way to characterize the revolution. Okay, so let's sum that quote up and we can come up with basically two main tenets of orthodox socialism. The first one is that the workers must have control over the workplace. The second one is private property will be abolished. I think the second one is where people have the biggest sort of misconceptions about socialism. So let's talk about private property and the concept of private property. Here, Marx specifically is highly influenced by uh, Proudhon, which is an anarchist thinker, a French anarchist thinker uh, about the same time period. And he writes a work uh, in which he uses the famous quote, property is theft. But Marx is motivated and inspired by how he distinguishes uh, different types of property. And he basically says that there are possessions and there are property. And I think this is funny because this is when we get into the nuances, like many people that are uh, against socialism, you know, they're like, the socialists are coming for your toothbrushes. Like socialists want all property to be communally owned. But that's a huge misconception and huge rhetoric to try to discredit socialism. Socialism fundamentally differs, has differences between possessions and property. So you can keep your toothbrushes, no one's coming for your toothbrush, but private property is a problem. You can equate private property with the means of production, like we talked about. These are the tools that are used to produce what people need to survive. So the socialists are uh, support the communal ownership of the means of production. In short, you can think of private property from the socialist lens as being anything that can be used to exploit someone else. So no matter how hard I try, I'm probably not going to be able to exploit you uh, by stealing your toothbrush, like using your toothbrush somehow. Like That's not going to happen. But I can definitely own a company or in Marxist time own a factory and use that to exploit people. So if I have control of the means of production, then I can be exploitative. So that's what socialists mean when they say private property the difference between property and possession. So keep that in mind, that's super important. Basically, when we're talking about orthodox socialism, you can use this litmus test. It has to meet both of these requirements. The first is, does it talk about worker control over the means of production? And the second one is, does it involve the abolition of private property? And if it doesn't, then it's not orthodox socialism. It might be something else, and this is an incredibly complex topic that we're boiling down. Uh, to very simple ideas. It might be some other type of version of socialism, but it's definitely not orthodox socialism. Uh, so keep that in mind. All right, now super briefly, we're gonna fly through uh, the Marxist conception for how we get to socialism from capitalism. I also just wanna use this time to remind you, if we're going too fast, you can always on YouTube slow down the video. So you can click in the settings and slow this down, or if you really want to be aggressive, you can also speed it up. 
So here we go. How, according to Marx and Engels, do we get from socialism, uh, sorry, capitalism to socialism? I'm going to read quotes. These are directly from the Manifesto of the Communist Party. So they say, first, uh, the first step is forming unions. The workers begin to form combinations, trade unions against the bourgeois. They club together in order to keep up the rate of wages. They found permanent associations in order to make provision beforehand for these occasional revolts. Here and there, the contest breaks out into riots. Now and then, the workers are victorious, but only for a time. The real fruit of their battles lies not in the immediate result, but in the ever-expanding union of the workers. Okay, step number one, form unions. But not because the union itself is powerful and can get a raise every once in a while or an improvement in working conditions or uh, so on, but because through the union, the proletariat begin to understand the collective power that they have as a class, which leads us to the next step, which is developing of a class consciousness. Quote, this organization of proletarians into a class and consequently into a political party is continually being upset again by the competition between the workers themselves, but it ever rises up again stronger, firmer, mightier. So Marx and Engels argue that the workers basically are convinced to compete among themselves, compete for jobs, compete for skills, compete based on different uh, races and religions and political parties. And think of all of the ways that the common man, quote unquote, is divided. Nowadays, even in today's society, Marx and Engels argue that that's manufactured by the bourgeoisie to keep them divided so they will never realize that they're basically all in it together. And that once they make that realization that they're all proletariat first before anything else, that that will lead to a successful revolution. This is why many socialists uh, are, I think, sort of uh, negatively called class reductionists, because they believe that class consciousness is more important than anything else. And that once we realize we are all proletariat before we are black or white or Christian or Muslim, etc., once we realize that we are first and foremost proletariat, and we have that in common, that we will begin to recognize our power in numbers. Marx himself doesn't actually use the term class consciousness. It's a future thinker that really solidifies this idea. And we can post a link in the description of this video to some of his work that really explains this really well. The next step, and this I think is probably the most surprising for the critics of socialism that don't really understand what socialism is, is to seize political power and to establish a true democracy. Quote, the movement will establish a democratic constitution, and through this, the direct or indirect dominance of the proletariat. Between capitalist and communist society, there lies the period of the revolutionary transformation of the one onto the other. Corresponding to this is also a political transition period in which the state can be nothing but the revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat. Now, this is a super important term that Marx and Engels use, the dictatorship of the proletariat. The anarchists have a huge problem with this term. And if you want more on that, you can watch our video, What is Anarchism?, that goes into this is the main fundamental difference between uh, socialism, uh, let's say Marxist socialism, and anarchism. Uh, so keep that in mind. The dictatorship of the proletariat. Because in order, according to orthodox Marxism, the first thing that will happen once the proletariat understand their power in numbers is they will seize control of the state and they will use their majority, their numerical majority, to implement social, socialist uh, policies. So they will have a dictatorship. They will be able to control the state. Like I said, anarchists have a problem with that. Check out our other video for information on that one. Then, of course, the next step after seizing uh, control of the government, democratic control, is to implement socialist policy. So the proletariat will use the democratic system and use the fact that they are the numerical majority, majority by far to implement policies that benefit themselves. This is actually nothing new. Going back to the ancient Greeks when they were talking about democracy, this was actually their critique of democracy too. Uh, and then going uh, forward, future thinkers all tackled this topic when it comes to democracy, that if you let the majority actually have power in a democracy, they will use that power to benefit themselves. Marx and Engels agree, and they say this is a key part of the revolution. They will implement policies and they will change the society to abolish private property and to provide communal control of the means of production. Those are the two main, uh, would be the two main next steps once the proletariat seizes political power. Now let's talk about the lower stages 
and higher stages of socialism. We're getting close to a point when these two terms, socialism and communism, are starting to mean two different things, though we're still talking about orthodox Marxism. We're still talking about Marx and Engels mainly and their ideas. But they do differentiate between lower and higher stages, when then, which then get built upon later on which f with future thinkers. So basically, the idea is that the transition goes from full-blown capitalism to the lower stage of communism and then on to the higher stage of communism. The lower stage can be defined by basically you get out what you put in. Um, it could be summed up by the quote, distribution according to actual labor time. Um, Marx never actually said this, but you get the idea. Uh, this idea that from each according to their ability to each according to what they contribute. Marx never said that, but you get the idea. This, the lower stage of communism is addressing um, the fact that you don't actually get out what you put in. So that's the lower stage, really put as simply as we can possibly put it. The higher stage, Marx actually does provide us an incredibly famous quote here that explains this, and it's from each according to their ability to each according to their need. So no longer do you get out exactly what you put in, you now put in what you can and you get out what you need. This is when we begin to address the unequal distribution of goods and services. So the lower stage of communism begins to address the fact that you don't, it's, you don't get paid, you don't have a right to your surplus labor. So it gives the people their surplus labor. The higher stage distributes that surplus labor fairly among the population. So these are two differences between the lower stage and the higher stage. I want to briefly mention this concept of vulgar socialism because I think it's really common now in the modern discourse surrounding socialism, these debates that we're having, almost always people are talking about vulgar socialism, which is handling the distribution of goods and services. I have to emphasize that Marx and Engels put their focus on first discussing the production and the inequality and exploitation that happens on the production side of the equation, not on the distribution side of the equation. And Marx very specifically says that if anyone tries to address the unfair distribution before addressing unfair production, this is what he calls vulgar socialism. And he's vehemently against this because he says this will never lead to an effective revolution economic material revolution. This will never lead to a successful socialist society. That we must first prioritize the unequal, the exploitation that takes place at the production level, the production side of the equation. But almost always, the rhetoric surrounding socialism nowadays, the debate in the media and politics and so on, has to do with distribution. This is a very intentional sleight of hand that is performed by the critics of socialism because it's much easier to win the moral argument to convince people that distributing things, uh, un distributing things evenly is unfair, it's morally wrong. They don't want to ever talk about the fact that exploitation is happening on the production side of things. So just keep that in mind. And Marx was adamant that we must first give the workers a right to their surplus labor, that that has to be the first step and only then in the higher stage, could we begin to discuss distributing products evenly? So that's vulgar socialism. Also important to note in the higher stage of communism, the state ceases to exist because the socialist conception of the state is that the state exists to basically referee class conflict, that there are inherent contradictions between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie and the state is necessary to make sure that that conflict does not completely destroy society. And following that logic, once there is no longer class conflict, the state will cease to exist. Again, the anarchists have a problem with this, but we'll talk about that, see that in uh, our other video. Also, if you're curious more and more details about the socialist conception of the state, we also have a video titled, What is the State? that goes into that. So check out that video as well. Now, surprisingly, and most people don't understand this, that's about it. We obviously oversimplified the Marxist conception of socialism, but Marx never provides a blueprint for what a future socialist society should look like. He gives us a little bit and you read between the lines, uh, but he never says, this is exactly my blueprint for the future. We have to understand that he very intentionally does that. He is a materialist and he believes 
that only the people that go through the downfall of capitalism and the revolution and build the socialist society essentially from the ground up will have the ideas and be able to think in the ways that could possibly create this new society. It would go against his fundamental beliefs in historical materialism if he tried to think of those things. For Marx, that was impossible. The material world had to change first before people could think of the ways that a new society, a new world essentially could be structured. He's not a fortune teller. He doesn't say this is exactly what's going to happen. He basically says capitalism will fall because of these inherent contradictions, because the proletariat have very fundamental interests than the bourgeoisie, and because of that, capitalism will fall. And his analysis essentially stops there. He doesn't provide uh, an outlook for the future and what future society will be like, because that would go against the fundamental beliefs of historical materialism and other Marxist ideas. Most people are really surprised to, to hear that Marx didn't lay this blueprint out. In fact, most, many of my students are surprised when they read the manifesto for class and they come in like, well, I didn't read anything about bread lines here or gulags or famines or, well, very clearly Marx and Engels didn't write any of those things. They didn't say, well, we're going to have a socialist revolution, then there will be a massive famine, and then we will need these camps, these labor camps. Like That obviously clearly was not in the conception of socialism by Marx and Engels. They weren't fortune tellers. They merely suggested that capitalism will fall due to inherent contradictions, and socialism, a different world, will exist after that. And it's up to the people that go through the actual physical revolution to make those changes. Now, one of the biggest critiques is timeline. Marx and Engels, Marx at least specifically, did believe that revolution would happen in his lifetime, which it very clearly didn't, but that's really the basic fundamental critique. They never provided uh, sort of a future blueprint for what society would be like. All right, this leads us now to Lenin, Stalin, and Mao, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. I'm definitely going to oversimplify uh, these three men and their actions and their ideas. I just want to give a very basic understanding of how their ideas and what they implemented differ than traditional Marxism and maybe some of the reasoning behind why that differed a little bit. So let's start with Lenin. And we have to understand that Lenin and Leninism are two, obviously two different things. One's the man and one are his ideas. But even then, Leninism doesn't really become an ism until Stalin takes power and starts to codify some of Lenin's ideas. Lenin is an incredible philosopher and writer in his own right, but his ideas don't become sort of this I hate to use the term dogma because it's this pejorative term used to describe socialists often, but it doesn't become sort of something that you follow until Stalin starts to really put it together and solidify it. So Lenin and Leninism and Lenin's actions and Leninism are sometimes uh, two different things. So let's understand that right off the bat. Lenin is the one that first begins to talk about socialism and communism being two different things. And then Stalin takes and builds upon that even more. So for, for Lenin, Socialism was defined by being the dictatorship of the proletariat, this period of time when the proletariat had control over government and the state and used that to implement socialist policies. Then communism becomes known as the higher stage uh, that Marx and Engels described, when the state would wither away uh, and so on, and we would have a totally egalitarian society. Now, we have to understand very clearly we have never had a communist society using this terminology in the history of the world other than primitive communism, perhaps like Marx described. But in, in advanced modern society, we have never gone through a revolution from capitalism to the higher stage, the final stage, which is communism. We have to understand that has never happened. So when people use, say, like, China is communist, a, they're not even really socialist, according to orthodox socialism, but they definitely are not communist. They have not reached this higher stage. They don't have full equality. The state very clearly has not withered away, and so on. So either this term is used out of ignorance or it's used intentionally to denigrate whatever is being discussed. I tend toward, um, people use it mostly for the latter. They use China to be communism to describe China because communism is this big, scary word. And in fact, the Red Scare, uh, we were scared of communist countries and so on, which is nonsense because no country has ever been communist. And now that you know the difference between the two, you can uh, determine between socialist countries and communist countries and understand the difference. Some countries have made it into some version of socialism, um, but no country has ever made it all the way through socialism into communism. That has never happened. So understand the difference nowadays with the modern usage of those terms, uh, starting with Lenin and into Stalin. Uh, 
that no society has ever been communistic. That has never happened. So just keep that in mind. One of the biggest things uh, that, in fact, this is like the landmark difference between Orthodox Marxism and Leninism is this concept of the revolutionary vanguard. The revolutionary vanguard uh, was this concept by Lenin of basically professional revolutionaries. And the idea was the common worker did not have the time to be studying Marxist theory in depth and to be involved in revolution 24 hours a day and so on. So he came up with this concept of the revolutionary vanguard. The revolutionary vanguard were basically professional revolutionaries. They did have time to study theory and become incredibly well-versed. And they did have time. They were paid by the party. They could be paid by the party. They had time to leave their traditional jobs, whatever that might have been, and to lead the revolution, to be the leaders of this movement, and to that was their professional job. So this concept of the revolutionary vanguard. This is a huge debate point between Orthodox Marxists and Leninists about whether or not this class of people should exist. Uh, the Orthodox Marxists, most of them believe that the revolutionary vanguard was not only unnecessary, but also could be oppressive. They're basically dictating the terms of the revolution to the rest of the working class instead of it coming basically from the bottom up. So that's one critique. That's one point of contention between Orthodox Marxists and Leninists is this concept of the revolutionary vanguard. Lenin was incredibly anti-imperialist, uh, which most people I think don't know for some reason unless they've studied this in depth. And this is one of the things that Lenin takes from Marx, takes and builds upon. He adds this to sort of the Marxist discourse because imperialism as we know it in modern advanced industrial society didn't really exist in Marx's time, but it definitely existed in Lenin's time. So he adds a lot of context to the relationship between capitalism and imperialism. And he has a lot of really important work on this and he in fact claims that imperialism is the highest form of capitalism basically going somewhere else and exploiting their economic resources that that is not something different from capitalism that that is capitalism in its highest peak and interestingly true to his word Lenin abandons almost all of the russian colonial and imperialist efforts any place that he thought wasn't traditionally russian basically abandons a good example is uh, iran as soon as Lenin takes power all Russian imperial interests basically in Iran, they pull out of that. Um, it's in interesting to think about. So he stays true to his word. He's anti-imperialist because it doesn't, very clearly doesn't fit with uh, socialist doctrine. And so he abandons all imperial projects. Another point of contention between the traditional socialists and the Leninists is the idea of the socialist state. So m some orthodox Marxists argue that even though they used the term dictatorship of the proletariat, that they actually used this in sort of a benign way, and it wasn't meant to be authoritarian at all. And then they would argue, this group of Orthodox Marxists would argue that Lenin, the state that Lenin implements is far more authoritarian than uh, what Marx would have decided. But this is a point of debate. Many people argue that this is exactly what uh, Marx was talking about when he talked about the dictatorship of the proletariat. But just understand that that's a point of contention between Leninists and Orthodox Marxists. What Marx actually meant when he talked about the dictatorship of the proletariat, the critiques of Leninism argue that Lenin's version of the state was more authoritarian than Marx would have originally uh, wanted or what he saw was going to be the future. Okay, on to Stalin and Stalinism. Stalin is perhaps one of the most uh, controversial figures, I think, in all of human history. Um, many, many debates about what Stalin did, what he actually thought, what he wanted to do and wasn't able to do, and things like that. So we're just going to cover this super briefly and talk about Stalin and Stalinism and how it differs from Orthodox Marxism and from Leninism as well. The first thing that we have to talk about here are the Great Purges mass deportations, executions, and labor camps, because there is no denying that gulags existed under Stalin. And uh, throughout his rule, he oversaw the purging of the Communist Party of non-Stalinist sympathizers. All told, it's estimated that at least, at least millions of people were either removed from the party, deported, executed, or sent to labor camps. It's estimated that around 1.5 million people died in the labor camps uh, overall. Now, this, there are much lower estimates and much higher estimates 
This is kind of a middle of the road, 1.5 million people. There's basically no denying that this happened, that the gulags existed and so on. The basically two sides of the debate are, one is that it was an atrocity and should have never happened and these people lost their lives. The other side is Stalin had to purge the party from these people that disagreed with him so that he could continue the communist project in the Soviet Union. And so he just justly did this. Um, so that's the two sides of that debate. But there's no denying that that did uh, happen during Stalin's rule. The next thing that we should talk about for Stalinism is Stalin abandons the concept of the global socialist revolution and he focuses on socialism in one state. So one of the fundamental tenets of Orthodox Marxism is that the revolution must take place on a global scale, that you can't have a socialist country next door to a capitalist country, that it must take place on an incredibly large scale. Stalin, as a result of global political economic factors, abandons that mission and focuses on making the Soviet Union as strong as absolutely possible. So he focuses basically internally. The argument against doing this, the critics say, that this resulted in a very, very authoritarian state. Um, so if we say that, you know, Lenin went sort of one notch from uh, the author one authoritarian notch from what Orthodox Marxism would want, the critics say Stalin was basically off the rails, that Stalin's state was uh, highly authoritarian. That's the critique. Related to this, Stalin had very, very aggressive economic policy to attempt to turn the Soviet Union into an economic powerhouse as quickly as absolutely possible because he wanted to be able to compete on the global stage with the other world powers, uh, Britain, the United States, etc. at the time. So he has this economic policy called the Great Turn and it's actually hugely successful in industrializing the Soviet Union. They become an industrial powerhouse relatively overnight compared to how long it took the United States and uh, Britain and so on. The Soviet Union becomes an industrial powerhouse incredibly, incredibly, incredibly quickly. However, there are downsides to this incredibly rapid transformation, which many people argue lead to the famine, which is well known uh, in Soviet, the history of the Soviet Union. It's interesting to think about how industrialization causes this uh, famine. And it's also interesting, the main critique, like I think people that don't understand this history, they often say Stalin caused this famine. Well, first off, no one man would be so powerful enough to create this famine that could kill millions of people. It was a, could have been a side effect of this economic policy, but Stalin himself uh, wasn't just sitting in his office thinking like, hmm, I'll create a famine that kills millions of people. Also, not only did he himself as an individual create it, he definitely did not do it intentionally to kill millions of people, which I think is often a common critique for people that don't know this history. They think of Stalin and they think, oh, he's the man that intentionally created a famine to kill millions of people. I mean, that's just absurd. No one has enough power to create a famine that will kill millions of people. That's just not possible. Interestingly, Stalin actually tried to implement policies to create greater democracy in the Soviet Union. He tried to pass uh, political reforms that would restore voting rights for some people that from which it had been removed during Lenin's era through the Civil War and so on. However, by this time, the Soviet Union was so massively bureaucratic that Stalin's attempts were basically uh, completely nullified by the bureaucracy and by other people in the party. So understand that it's this interesting thing that Stalin actually tried to implement policies and changes at the political level, reforms that would have created more democracy in the Soviet Union and was unable to do so because it had become, the party itself had become this massive bureaucratic powerhouse in which Stalin actually didn't have that much power. So we're stuck with this controversial figure who on one hand, people try to argue, caused this famine intentionally to kill millions of people. And on the other hand, are forced to face the fact that he didn't have enough power to create more democratic political reforms within his own party. So we're really stuck kind of how to analyze Stalin. And then lastly, I can't mention Stalin without mentioning World War II, because contrary to the highly westernized discourse surrounding World War II, the United States was focused mostly on the Pacific theater. And we have to understand that the Red Army took the brunt of 
of the European theater in fighting the Nazis. So here's some numbers here just to understand the scale of this. Um, the United States in World War II lost 400,000 soldiers, which was about 0.32% of the total population of the U.S. The U.K. lost about 400,000 soldiers as well, which was 0.94% of the total population of the U.K. Now think about this. The Soviet Union lost 11 million soldiers, which was roughly 14% of the total population at the time. And in addition to this, they also lost 11 million civilians. So the casualty for the Soviet Union in World War II was higher than 20 million when we think about soldiers and civilians that lost their lives. If anyone deserves credit for defeating Nazi, Hitler and the Nazis, it's Stalin and the Red Army. So we can critique the advanced rapid industrialization and we can critique, critique the, uh, the great turn and the famine that resulted and the gulags and all of these things that Stalin uh, oversaw during his leadership, but we can't escape this conversation without understanding how incredibly crucial it was, the Red Army and Stalin's leadership, in defeating the Third Reich. We cannot, uh, we cannot move on without also understanding that. So understand that Stalin is incredibly controversial, highly debated by historians and socialists and all kinds of people from different walks of life. Uh, this man and what happened in the Soviet Union under his rule, what he believed in and his ideas and so on. Okay, let's talk about Mao and Maoism in China and what that looks like. Um, Mao actually in the beginning is boys with Stalin, uh, but then they basically break up and they're not best friends anymore. And Mao abandons Stalinism and a lot of his ideas and basically goes back into to Leninism for inspiration and builds upon Leninism and comes up with some ideas of his own. So this evolution of socialist thinking in China. Uh, the first thing to note is that the socialist revolution in China was much, much, much more rural. China had, uh, I don't want to say no, but almost relatively no industrialization of any kind. It was massive, massive farmlands and peasant populations. So Mao was dealing with a completely different sort of landscape than either Lenin or Stalin when they were implementing socialism in the Soviet Union. So that changes the way that uh, this revolution goes down. Another thing that's important for Mao is, uh, I guess I'll mention this briefly, the people's war and protracted, protracted warfare. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this. If you're curious about it, you can just Google Mao and protracted warfare. But this is interestingly a uh, military strategy and tactic for how the people in the countryside were able to defeat the industrial army that existed in China at the time. And then uh, actually Che Guevara and Castro used similar tactics in Cuba as well to defeat Batista's army. So interesting military strategy. I won't spend a lot of time on that. You can just Google protracted warfare if you're interested. Uh, and in fact, Mao has extensive writings on this that you can read. Uh, you can find them on the internet easily. So just understand he develops actually military strategy and military tactics to implement this revolution, which is fascinating. The next thing to talk about is the Great Leap Forward, which is Mao's economic policy to industrialize China. So Stalin had the great turn, Mao has the Great Leap Forward. And it's essentially, it's not the same economic policy, but the idea is the same. The idea is to make China an industrial powerhouse as quickly as absolutely possible. And interestingly, the same thing results. There's massive famine throughout China. Now, I want to pause and make you have you think about this. The discourse surrounding communism in both the Soviet Union and China surrounds these famines. And many people blame these famines on communism itself. The much more accurate way of historically portraying this would to be that say that famine, the famines were a result of rapid industrialization. There's nothing about communism that resulted in these famines. It was the fact that these two men, Stalin and Mao respectively, were trying to industrialize incredibly, incredibly rapidly. Now, I'm not going to spend time in this video talking about the economic reasons for why rapid industrialization led to famine. You can Google that on your own. But just think about how the discourse would be different if we framed it as industrialization caused famine. Rapid industrialization resulted in the famines of the Soviet Union and of China under Mao, rather than skewing the conversation, in fact, in an absurd way to suggest that communism somehow caused these famines. And ask yourself why the discourse in the Western world 
is that communism caused the famines rather than industrialization, rapid industri forced industrialization causing the famines. Just think about that for a second. The other thing that Mao is uh, really well known for in Maoism, a uh, fundamental tenet of Maoism, is the mass line. This is very, very interesting. Uh, in contrast to the Leninist theory of the revolutionary vanguard, in which a select group of people dictate basically the terms of the revolution to the masses, Mao prioritized the desires of the masses themselves. And the idea of the mass line is basically a three-step process. Uh, first, the party converses with the masses to learn their needs and the, their demands. Then the party interprets the demands and the needs of the masses in terms of Marxist socialist thought. So Mao still believes that basically the average worker, in fact, the rural peasant in Mao's case, doesn't have the knowledge of Marxist theory very clearly and the skills to be able to determine what they need in the terms of Marxism, but the party does. And so for Mao, the party talks to the masses and learns their desires and their needs and what they want out of the revolution. Then they take those and they put them in terms of Marxism. So uh, classist analysis and so on. Then this is a three-step process. So the first step is the party talks to the masses. The second step is the party takes their demands and puts them in the Marxist discourse and applies them to the revolution. And the third step basically is to repeat, to go to the masses and say, this is a Marxist analysis of what you want. What do you think about this? And get feedback. Uh, it's basically like a feedback loop. And then this repeats over and over again, steps one through three. Talk to the masses, analyze their demands, and give it, give it a class context. Go back and ask them and educate them if they think that this is correct, and they repeat this throughout. So this is a, much different than the Stalin uh, or the Lenin and their concept, Stalin, Lenin's concept of the revolutionary vanguard, much different than that. This is a direct, like, reflexive relationship between the party and the masses and including Marxist theory and educating the masses at the same time and so on. Many people say that Mao was forced to do this because such a massive proportion of the population were rural peasants in China at the time during the revolution. The other thing that's important for Mao is the cultural revolution. Both Lenin and Stalin were devout materialists, as you might imagine, and Mao was as well. It's not as if he wasn't. But Mao put a lot more emphasis on the ideological realm. It's interesting that Lenin actually has some writing on this literally like a month before he dies about focusing at the cultural level. Uh, but it never really gets implemented the way that it does in Mao's China. So he has the Cultural Revolution, which basically is mass, mass, massive propaganda campaigns to get the populations on board with socialism. Now, before we all critique uh, the Chinese media propaganda machine, understand that this happens in every single country, that even the United States, even under capitalism, we like to fool ourselves into thinking that we have completely free press but the media is propaganda in the United States just the same as it is in uh, almost any other country. Now, I wouldn't go as far as to say that like, the media in China is just as free as the media in the United States, but we really have to be careful where we're throwing stones when we're critiquing the idea of propaganda campaigns in different countries. Every country has a propaganda campaigns throughout to indoctrinate the population to believe in whatever system they think is valuable. So the United States has propaganda campaigns to help, help to force the population to believe in the merits of capitalism and democracy, just like China, and specifically in Mao's time, had, has propaganda campaigns to, to force the population to believe in the merits of communism and, and et cetera. So keep that in mind. But Mao's cultural revolution is something that Stalinism and Leninism uh, didn't really emphasize, and definitely Orthodox Marxism didn't have either. Now I hope you understand the difference between Orthodox Marxism, Leninism, Stalinism, and Maoism. Though we reduced all of these, and definitely the last three men, Lenin, Stalin, and Mao, uh, we've overly simplified all of these, so this video didn't turn out to be uh, incredibly, incredibly long. Uh, but just now I hope you at least have a very fundamental understanding of traditional socialism, Leninism, Stalinism, Maoism, and basically the basic tenets of socialism and communism.